cheaper. So there was some struggle between the old school lath and plaster to the drywall industry. And at that point, it was three eighths wood lath. Pretty right? much, well, pretty much three eighths and a half inch. Um, very, very few, to my understanding, drywall houses until the late 40s. Yeah. There was a mix. Okay, so what they tried to do originally with drywall is create a, a base for plaster. Right. And they had things called button board. Button board. Yeah, it was just little, I think, 16 inch by four foot sheets with holes in it to mm -hmm. the, the plaster would key in. Yeah. So fast forward to the 50s when drywall, particularly in California, Drywall panels became very popular when, the way I understand it again, after World War II, the housing boom, they wanted a quicker, cheaper, more economical way of doing walls, especially track homes. So they started um, using drywall sheets, um, used to be called sheetrock, it still is, that's a USG yeah, yeah. brand. And um, a lot of the lathers transition into the drywall industry. So the old lathers, putting up the wood lath, um, started hanging the drywall. Mostly half inch, five eighths only in the, in the garage firewalls. I wonder how they ever came up with, hey, we can get this product called gypsum, we can mine it, and we can, we can smash it really flat and put paper on both sides and it'll be like, the wall. Yeah, the thing about gypsum, I think the reason they use gypsum, what again, the way I understand it, gypsum is is the most, if not one of the most prevalent minerals on the planet. And there's some chemical quality to the gypsum that when it heats up, it sweats and lets off moisture, which creates more of a fire barrier, which gives it that type X fire resistant capability just through the um, mineral quality of the gypsum itself. Anyway, again, that's how it's always been explained to me. So, Where is, so, so there's obviously gypsum mines that, that mine this stuff. Yeah. I, well, there. I know there's plants in Arizona. I think California's got some plants. Um, so it's not necessarily a renewable resource because we probably have a finite amount of gypsum. Well, it's not renewable, but it is um, recyclable. Right. They have played around with recycling it. So I don't know how cost-effective that is, but I know... Um, Back in the 70s, there was talk about maybe sending it all to one place. Now I know when you take it to the landfills, you can separate it out, and it's about half the cost to dump than it is regular rubbish. So it, is, it does have a recyclable component to it. Plus, the gypsum's really good for the dirt. So I think if you crush it up and put it back in the dirt, you know, it just kind of, it, it's good. I know gypsum itself is good for for clay soil and dirt. And, and then what's the what's the so you use different compounds for mudding the nails and taping etc. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Okay. So basically, the drywall is installed, and then um, all the joints and the screws and and the mistakes need to be corrected. So it's basically a process of tape embedding the tape in a joint compound. That, that joint compound, we call it all-purpose. Basically, the all-purpose embeds the tape, and the reason you use all-purpose is it has a bonder in it, a glue. A glue. A yeah. glue. There are other muds. Some of the muds don't have any glue in it, and they're, the, they're more of the finished product, the topping. So you don't ever want to use a topping to start with and embed the tape. So you tape it, and that's what we call taping. Okay. Tape the joints. Tape the joints and, tape and use... Tape tubes right. So I don't know. I mean, you know, there's a joint in the wall, and you embed the tape. You would embed the tape over the joint using the all-purpose. That needs to dry. So that's your first day or the first step. And then generally most jobs or any time you're doing any drywall work, there's a, usually inside a house or a finished area, there's usually a minimum of two coats. First coat, second coat. So that would be a first coat over the tape and then a second coat over the first coat and each, each coat goes a little bit further beyond and feathers the edge. Okay. So when you say feather the edge, I think what we're talking about on this particular joint, 
is that tape's about two inches, right? Tape's two inches wide. So two inch mesh tape comes across this joint and then the mud goes on it and the mud goes on either side of it. And the more mud, so it's, is it sand in between? Yeah, okay, those? this is a good example. This is a, a recessed joint. It, it's Which, a by the way, stopping you right there, that's how drywall's made. Drywall is made on the edges, it, it flares in. So you create, yeah, we have something. So here's a, here's a piece. This is a four by eight sheet, a quarter inch. Um, it comes from the factory like this. So we call this a butt joint. It's a factory edge. We call this a factory butt joint. It's cut square from the factory and it's clean edge. The usually, almost always the long, the long edges, we call them recessed edges because there's a little recess here. So this is a quarter inch and then there's a little recess, uh, less than a sixteenth probably, but let's just call it a sixteenth. And this is wrapped in paper and it's glued and sealed on the back side. So it narrows. So yes, and so that's what we have over here. So this is where the tape goes and it's recessed so you can embed the tape and get close to this flat plane. Right. So after that's taped, Next day, after it dries, you would generally run a six inch knife or box over this. Feather the edges, don't leave big, ed don't leave big, like see this edge here is feathered. Feathered so thin down. Yes, as tight as possible. Okay, that dries, that's the first coat. It'll need another coat, second coat, a little bigger knife, let's just say an eight inch or a ten inch knife. Again, to cover the two edges, feathered, and that's second coat. Again, that dries. Now, are you, are you, aren't you mudding the nail holes in the first go around as well? When you... Yeah, you want to spin and look at this wall? That's a much better wall. Okay, so here's our recess joint, transitions into our factory butt joint. Process is the same. The only difference between this joint and this joint, this joint has a recess, this joint has no recess. So how do you get that joint? We'll, we'll get there. Okay, so we've done two coats here. The same process is here, but a little bit different on the coating. So since this is a butt joint, we do tape it the same. Okay, but your first two coats would be here and here to create the feathering on the side of the tape. And then a little bit of sort of, we've created somewhat of a recess in the middle. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's, That's cool. first coat. Now the second coat obviously would be again here or here. So you're filling the middle and then you're going to hit the two sides. Yep. Okay, second coat. Now the same thing with the screws. You're going to first coat it. It's going to dry. Does that happen when you guys put Generally it happens when you're first coating here, you're first coating here. So the, the, key, the, the key for efficiency on taping is trying to keep the whole project in the same circular process. So you don't want to have second coat, first coat, finished coats all going on at the same time. You want, to, you want to keep the process continuous. And I would imagine you want the absolute minimum amount of mud to do the job rather than, the, when, rather than more mud that you have to send off. Yeah, because here's, here's what we're going to get to now with the second coat. You, what, what a skilled tradesman will learn over time is how not to crown the joints. Um, if you start crowning, that's where the shadowing in the house, the lighting will start showing and, and they'll, they'll highlight right out and you'll see little bumps, little crowns, okay? So that's the key to what you said about not using too much mud. You want to use enough to cover, but the bare minimum to cover. You, you don't want to use so much that you have to keep working it to get rid of that crown. So first coat, second coat, first coat, second coat. Now, these joints, will, for, for almost any texture, which we call decoration, are, pretty, are, are good enough for most decorations. The butt joints, however, need a third, a third process, and we call that troweling out the joints. So that third day, you'd be troweling out the joints. You might be doing a little touch-up, and this house isn't a good example, but if there's an eight foot ceiling here, there's going to be an angle here. Now this angle, we have tools, we call them angle boxes. It, it gets hit with an, it's already taped, just like that, for, like, just like the embedment. And so 
generally we trowel out the butts and run the angles on that third day. Now, the, after that, it's all dry. There's some sanding that happens to, to maybe... Do you sand in between applications? Well, you can. You don't have to, and then that depends on the talent of the taper. Right. Because that's your whole goal over time with experience is to continually improve to where there's less and less sanding. Yeah, less and less work on, less and less man hours and people right. touching the same part of the wall. Right. A good taper can get all the way to this process without any sanding. There might be some brush down because you'll have, we call them boogers, you, there might be a little blob or something that needs to be knocked off. But generally, everything we use is sandable. So any mistake we make, you can sand it out. So the less you're, the, the more you're limiting that, yeah. the more efficient you are. Okay, so, but there's generally some brushing down, sanding, just to take off some of the edges. And, it, and again, it depends on the texture. You know, depends on the finish right. texture. Okay. Is it skip and smear? Or? Skip and smear, there's hardly any sanding because the texture itself is so heavy, it, it almost looks in, in places like it's not sanded. Mm -hmm. So, usually, generally, the lighter you go, the thinner the texture, the more sanding there is. So, is, so a glaze or a number five finish? Is a level good? five is the ultimate smooth. Um, we can get into textures if you want, but you know, level five just means that all paper surface area is skimmed with a thin layer of drywall compound. Okay, level four, starting with that's level five, that's Cadillac, that's basically it's counterintuitive, but the smoother you go, the more work it takes because yeah. you have to take out all the imperfections, oh my God. even though we're starting smooth. Well, we're starting smooth. So you think, well, I don't have to do anything to that, yeah. but, but you do because the drywall mud itself has a different paint absorption than the paper. So you want to make one skin so when the paint goes on, you don't get the phenomenon yeah. we call flashing. Yeah. Everybody's done everything correct, but the paint itself acts a little different between mud and paper. So level five, the theory is a complete skin of compound. It's all one surface, so everything should work the same. So, so. the guys that are doing the texture and that are mudding, especially doing the, the final texture, so that's pretty artistic. Let me, let me get rid of this. That's a pretty artistic hand. I mean, you, that, and that's, that's a real art. And it's, it's, it's an art. There's only way yeah. you can call it. And, and unless you're a natural, you practice and practice and got really good at it. Could you tell us a little bit about backup, the art of hanging? Because what kind of tools does it take? Do you need, do you need saws? Do you need stuff like that? I mean, what, what tools? Well, hanging, hanging for me and, and the way I was trained, it, 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 it's a dance. You have two people hanging the big sheets. So yeah. you, you have to operate and together. you like to hang 12 foot. I understand drywall guys like to hang 12 foot sheets because it's just more board, more wall. The more wall you cover in a sheet, the less sheets you gotta hang. Less joints. And the less joints. It, um, less butt joints. Real quick on the math, you know, you have an eight foot sheet and a 12 foot sheet. So theoretically, um, if you use 12 foot sheets, you've already cut everything down by one third because you don't have this extra piece. Now, if you have small rooms, yes, that's great. But usually in a, in a, in, in, in a global environment, the whole house, you're taking all your cutoffs and you're using them on your small walls. So that's why we use 12 foot sheets for, for um, it's more economical, it's better on the taper. Um, it is bigger, but it's hard to hang on a five inch. Yeah, you know, but that's but that's silly. that's just what the trade is. Um, they make them bigger. They make them up to sixteen. Um, generally, in a lot of large tracks, you'll see a lot of fourteen foot board because bedrooms are twelve plus, less than fourteen, sometimes bigger. But you're you're cutting down on the butt joints. Do you ever hang drywall vertically? Yeah. Oh yeah. Sometimes it's there are uh, that just yeah. A lot of times it'll be spec'd out for it. Huh. Um, generally, that's more of a commercial, institutional, hospital, school, where it's just spec'd out to hang it vertically. Is there any reason for that? Reason for rhyme? Um, yeah. Um, sometimes sound. Sometimes fire. Um, a big long wall with a lot of light exposure, it's not a good idea to go vertically because then it has a tendency to flash the joints more because now you've got vertical joints compared right. to horizontal right. joints. And occasionally. Sometimes the sun. You always stagger yeah. your joints too, right? Yeah, and you stagger, you always stagger your butt joints. Always. You guys never line up your butt joints. Not intentionally. Not intentionally. You should always stagger them. And, and part of the reason for that is, is finish. 
um, this is this is a more difficult joint to finish and it's going to finish wider you're going to create a little bit of humpage in here and that's why we go wider yep. to flatten out the hump if you line that all up now you've got a really long big hump so stagger them structurally it's better um, I'm not sure it could even be a code thing. I, I don't know, yeah. but it's just a common practice to stagger your joints What are the tools? What do you, what do you what's a drywall going to have now? Well back to what we talked about in the beginning in the beginning It was just a knife a circle cutter a saw and a hammer. And okay, a, a tape one. tape knife um, Okay, so yeah the the rasp um, My dad always called that an apprentice cheater <laughs> Okay, a rasp a rasp can be used at times when it's necessary, but the more skilled you are and the more experienced as a journeyman you are, you don't need it because everything you can do with a rasp, you can do with a knife. Yep. It just takes it takes a learn it takes a long time to learn it. So, so what's the process? What's the process of cutting drywall? Just because some of these some of the people in my class will not know how drywall is cut. Can we have you cut a piece? Dale. I don't have much. Oh, wait, 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 wait. There we go. Okay. Now, this is 